Well, it's kind of absurd to like lecture in front of such a small group. So, yeah. should we get closer? You just no, it's fine. Uh, just feel free to interject if you have any questions or comments. I'm just going to move since it's not a lot of folks. I'm not going to do like a formal thing. Just mm -hmm. move quickly. Say what I need to say, and if you um, yeah. If you have comments or questions, just go with it on the front. Yeah. Oh, Ryan. Wait for Ryan. Oh, okay, forget about it. Now I'm going to give a really formal, <laughs> serious. <laughs> Ryan's here. Oh my gosh, I didn't know everything. you were coming. <laughs> Man, I'm sure it's so hard to find. How That's what everyone said. I thought I thought. Is this your ploy to try and make sure nobody comes? Yes. Yeah. I was going to give a really casual, low key talk, but then Ryan showed up, so now. <laughs> Not supposed to be very accurate. It has to be precise. Yes. Do you mind if I put on all the quantitative stuff? Now? Yeah. <laughs> he said feel free to interject and criticize him at any point, right? Except for Ryan. Okay. <laughs> Everybody else. Um, okay. Yeah, so the general idea for this talk was to sort of show how the professional data that my uh, professional bee colleagues work on and that I work on in the museums can integrate with the so-called citizen science regular people out there with cameras, for example, taking photos of bees. And um, at this point, for me, the uh, citizen science and professional data are starting to blur as far as you know, when you get photos like this, they get better and better, and, and you can easily identify the species. Uh, you have the GPS that you can take up right off the camera. You have a date, again, the date and time are on the camera, so you can then with the date, you can work on phenology. When is the bee flying? What time of day is it flying? You can also look at, um, you can map any one of these images, assuming it has a GPS coordinate. And then conversely, when you get into the professional images like this, I think some of them have some visual appeal. They could be useful for public outreach and generating support for conservation. Like this, this is a specimen that um, our bee assistant at AM&H caught just this year probably has the longest tongue of any bee in the world, and it lives in one of the most threatened areas of western Ecuador. So something like that um, could have some potential as far as reaching the public. So I was going to talk a little bit about what is bee research, what are we trying to do in the first place on a more professional level, and then talk about Bug Guide, which is an image database that I work on, and the online community and how that leads to discoveries and useful things. And then I'll talk about how we integrate, using biodiversity portals, some of the professional data and the specimen records with the images and the citizen science data. And then I was going to have a practical session if anybody's interested. Mm -hmm. So bee research, uh, it looks like we're just wandering around in the desert, but we actually have hypotheses that we're testing. We're trying to discover material useful for phylogenetic studies and so forth. In this case, we have an association between a, a bee and another bee, which is a parasite of the first bee. And this is a new association at the family level, so we're trying to document it. We only have circumstantial evidence of bees flying over the ground. We want to find the nest site, then we can dig it up and do a proper study. So what we do when we're collecting is we drive down dirt roads uh, out in the middle of nowhere until we find a nice big patch of flowers, and then we stop the car and get out. Collect. We can also, while we're doing this type of research, we can put out a string of, um, of passive bull traps. We can have some here. Oh, I have them somewhere. You can put out passive traps that will passively collect tons of bees while you're actually um, out actively netting them. And uh, it's just a big net. Studying your nest. What? It's just a big net. No, it's like a little yellow souffle cup, a little bowl that you mm -hmm. fill with soapy water, and the bees accumulate in that. <laughs> And then a few hours later, after you're done with your research, you come back and you've got a whole bunch of dead drowned bees in the cups. Then you get a tea strainer, strain them out, and you can put them in whirl packs with alcohol and bring them back home. Um, so we find the nest, and then we spend a whole lot of time baking in the hot sun, digging it up. Meanwhile, while we're failing, we're failing to find nests in our target species and not encountering the rare things we want for our molecular studies, we run into all kinds of incredible uh, other bees 
on the flowers and do sort of a long-term inventory of the flower host relationships and uh, photograph them in the process so that we can share the, the photos as well as the specimens. So the goal is to catch the bee, um, have a molecular grade specimen, image the live bee, and then take it back and image the dead bee. Make sense? What we really get excited about is when we have a, a really active bee nest site, because that is an optimal research opportunity. We can, of course, just collect regular old bees visiting the flowers, but we also can get mass numbers of bees nesting in the holes. And you get a whole succession where one bee will nest, a different species will be a secondary occupant, then you'll get parasites, and then parasites of the parasites, and so forth. And pretty soon, um, you have a fantastic place for collecting um, of specimens because you get all the parasites in addition to the regular bees, but you also have a chance to dig into the earth wall and find the bees. So this was in eastern Turkey with our host, um, Hikmet Uzbek here. And this sort of raises the point, if you're trying to do your own collecting and uh, field work, it's extremely important to partner with the local researchers, because we never would find a site like this on our own. And also, we put his name on all the specimen labels. It really avoids a lot of potential problems with um, permits. Down the road, somebody, they're not going to say, oh, these folks were just coming in and uh, you know, taking all of our patrimony and bringing it back and cutting us out of the loop. This way we have a real partner and friend who also helps us with all the logistics and also smooths things over as far as the legal issues as well. <clears throat> so at a different site, fortuitously, we actually found a bee that, that he had discovered that was named after him in Turkey. And then uh, through the internet, we posted some photos I had taken of the bee. And it turned out that our, our Swiss colleagues had been in Iran and found the very same species. So we uh, got all the, the nest cells, these are the origami nests of the bee makes by folding up the petals. And then it makes a sandwich of mud, and then it folds up a whole bunch of other petals on the inside to protect the, the larvae within this, uh, this nest. That's the that's that's size of the nest. This is a nest the, cell. The so what the bee does is it digs a burrow mm -hmm. in the soil yeah. and actively digs a hole. And then within the hole, it lines, it uses folded up petals that it carry. It cuts the petals with its mandibles or mouth parts and brings them back and then folds them up like origami. Then it um, collects a bunch of mud and packs the mud on the inner surface of the, of the petals and then it comes, makes a whole second trip to get even more petals, then makes an inner lining, then it um, lays its egg, and, and no, then it packs in a whole bunch of pollen, then it makes a, a, lays the egg and then closes the, with even more petals and so on. Um, the whole point is to protect the larvae from desiccation and maybe from parasites, which are a big deal in the bee world. Sorry, how big are these um, petals? How big is it? Um, they're just individual petals from a regular sized uh, flower. I mean the... the oh, how, how big? It's not very big. It's maybe a centimeter long. Mm -hmm. One centimeter long total. So it's like one pupa itself will have one petal? Yeah, only one individual bee. So most of the bees are solitary. Only some of the bees are social. Most of them, each female bee makes uh, one cell, makes her own nest and then she provisions one cell at a time. Mm -hmm. So, so each, what's called a nest cell, has a single bee inside of it, correct? So that's why they're small. But again, this is an opportunity where we have something of scientific interest, but it also has some aesthetic appeal, and it allows us, uh, the more charismatic species become sort of ambassadors for the ones that make really dull brown nests. Yeah. Um, this is... A, one of my mentors, Jerry Rosen, digging in um, Akuyu, which is the Tiger Mountain north of Beijing. And we found this cave, and under the cave, or actually our Chinese colleagues found the cave. So again, we want to work with the local folks. Otherwise, it's illegal anyway. But we go in and we dig in the dirt, and we find the nest cells of a bee that is attacked by another bee, which is a parasite. It has big sickle-shaped mandibles that it uses to kill the host. And then it has uh, long tubercles that it uses to detect the host and then it um, lays this larvae that sort of swims around on the liquid provisions. So it's a very interesting opportunity to study the parasites. So this gentleman is more than 85 years old. 
and he goes on these like month long field trips out to rural Sichuan. And we met our Chinese colleagues, they were about 61 years old or so. They had just fully retired and they were complaining about how burdensome it was for them <laughs> to take a bus cross town to meet with us for a few hours and how they were so tired and just wanted to rest you know, before they went to their final reward. And you know, here's this, this guy, uh, uh, because bee research is so fun that you never retire, ever. <laughs> So we do, this was, these were all in, in downtown urban Beijing, one of the most heavy, heavily polluted places in the world, and then these are out in some of the most wonderful places in rural Sichuan. The point being that we find the bees everywhere, we do research everywhere. And if we're in the city or in a national park where we can't collect, we take photos. This was interesting. Um, is to show the opportunities at touristic sites to find things. Um, this was at Great Wall of China in Mutianyu. And uh, this bee, the male was quite incredible with these yellow stripes and modified legs and was perching on the actual Great Wall of China, which is what that is. And then down below the Great Wall in the um, pine forest while I was looking for nuthatches, this uh, female showed up out of nowhere and started collecting resin off of the tree, which she uses to build the nest. So I went back to, um, I'd never seen any bee like this. I went back to Zoological Academy in China, looked through their collection, they didn't have any, any of these at all, until I went to the type collection. It turns out this species is known, uh, only described in 2004, only known from the types in the, in the very special collection, not even in the regular collection, and yet this thing is, is common evidently on the Great Wall of China. So even the touristic sites, you can find things. One of the best places for bees is out in the desert. Um, the drier it is, it seems like the more bees there are. So we make a special effort to visit these countries, and we're sort of obsessed with driving down the road till we find these patch of flowers and then uh, do our thing. When it gets really dry, we find even better bees. This is one of some of the one of the best places for bees you could possibly find is in an extreme desert like this, where you find tiny little patches of flowers. You get the most incredible species there. Also, a really great place to put out bull traps, passive traps, because there's so few flowers, there's nothing to compete with them. If you put out these traps in Singapore, they have a lot of competition from the vegetation, right? But here, they stand out a mile away, and the bees will all come in and die in the passive traps. You can put a propylene glycol trap, which doesn't evaporate, and you can get some that are vertebrate safe. So even if a fox comes along and eat it, it won't die. And like a, a pet safe antifreeze is basically what you want. You can stick it out in the desert for months and months, and when you come back, you find the most incredible things in the passive trap. So out in the desert, we find uh, bees that are just quite numerous and unlike anything that you find in other environments. Like this one's covered in white hairs, like here, which probably re uh, reflects the sun and protects it from UV damage, in particular the abdomen where it's storing the eggs. I should point out that this um, photo was taken by Hadel Go of a specimen at the AMNH, and it's uh, been databased. So what this means, all the label data are available and the image are available, and it's integrated into uh, various biodiversity portals in way that I'll, ways that I'll explain later. We also go into the, the real rainforest, and there's a problem for bee collecting here, where, where are the flowers? <coughs> Basically, this habitat is very wet, and it's very hard to find uh, bees mm -hmm. in any uh, traditional way, like walking around with a net looking for flowers is not going to work too well. Maybe up in the canopy, but then you can't reach them. So what we do in that case is we put out uh, chemical baits. These are essential oils, like oil of wintergreen, eucalyptus oil. We put it out, in this case, on the leaves, and all these incredible orchid bees come in and they fill their hind legs here, which are big, greatly enlarged. There's a black slit there. That slit is the entrance to a, a perfume flask or vial. So what's happening is the bee has sponges on his leg. He, he gathers up the perfume, which some, in some cases they actually actively gather DDT because they're attracted to that chemical. They stick it in the slit here and then they fill up their um, hind leg with uh, various types of perfume. In the process, they are the pollinators of a whole bunch of different species of orchids.
Another thing we do is go up in the canopy. And the, the story of this collecting event is that we were kind of uh, burnt out from collecting bees because we did it too much. So we thought, okay, we'll go up here and look for rare canopy birds. So we brought a telescope and everything. But it turns out all the birders up there had been peeing on this branch right here. <laughs> like, who knows, for months and months. And they built up all the... What do you call those salts and minerals and whatever that are in your pee? And it, it attracted all these incredible canopy bees that were buzzing around here while we were trying to watch birds. Meanwhile, a whole bunch of other bees were landing on us. It, it proved to be an undescribed species, but they were landing eating our sweat. So we were trying to see the birds, but meanwhile, catching all kinds of bees. We actually caught more bees up in the canopy than we did when we were officially bee collecting the other days. So this site is in eastern Ecuador at the opposite end from Ecuador from here. It's at exactly the opposite end of the world. In other words, if you drill straight down through the earth, you end up here. And we find the highest number of highly eusocial hive bees in the entire planet Earth at this site, which are these uh, stingless bees, which we also have in, in uh, Singapore. So we're really interested in how to compare the, the fauna here with what's happening on the opposite side of the, of the world. These we catch with honey bait, which you can also do in Singapore. What you do is you get a squirt bottle with some honey, dilute with water, you add some salt, and you can squirt it on vegetation. What happens is these are social, so one of the workers will find it. Go back to the hive, signal to all the other bees that there's a resource, and then uh, the rest of the colony, or at least some of the other workers, will come back, and then you, get, you can collect far more than you ever would see on flowers or other ways. So you can get a big series of, of them. We get at least 60 species at this one site, of which at least maybe 15 or 20 are undescribed or new to science. Then the other thing we do to get bees, because it's so hard to find the flowers, is we throw out some dead chicken, like this, and uh, it not only attracted the female bee, but the male came and made it with her. <laughs> That's actually a piece of rotting dead chicken. From, from one of our meals. So we take all the like salt, we just get from the dining hall, we get salt and chicken and all kinds of stuff, and we throw it around the ground, and we pee on it, and then we got some laundry detergent and threw it around the ground. Pretty soon we had turtles, we had these guys, all kinds of bees buzzing around. Did you say laundry detergent? Yeah, they like that as well. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but we all, in addition to the, the remote uh, wilderness areas, we we do urban bee studies, and it turns out that there's a lot of species in cities. So just in New York City, we have 256 bee species found so far, more than 100 species in the park right near my house in New York City, which is actually more than have ever been recorded in Singapore. <laughs> and then 54 species in the ultra-urban... Uh, you think that's going to be the case uh, a few decades from now, once all the Singaporean ones have been described? No, there's going to be more than that in Singapore. But it is true that the temperate zone has, in general, more bees that are easier to find than the tropics. So it's, a, it's partly an artifact and partly real. But then the other thing that's interesting is we find 17 exotic bee species in New York, mm -hmm. meaning native to the old world, that are, and they're constantly arriving. So every couple of years we get a new exotic bee from Asia mm -hmm. or North America that shows up. Whereas in Singapore, uh, we have zero. No exotic, no exotic bee species known from Singapore versus 17 New York City alone. So this is another big study. We've got about 12,000 specimens, but we also have images. We, we find, even in the city, new species for science, like this. And it turned out, I was on an airplane, and we, there, it ended up in the airplane magazine, and they had stolen all my data <laughs> and charted it out in the air, airline magazine. They put your name in there. No, no, no. They did not. <coughs> did you call the steward desk? Right, so now I'm going to move into some citizen science. So that was more like real bee research. So Bug Guide is an image database in an online community. What happens is people submit their images. In this case, it's a fly that's pretending to be a wasp. This is just from today. They have all these images they submit. And on my phone, while I'm on the um, bus or something, or when I'm bored or trying to parent or something, I can virtually curate these images and tag them and move them around and stuff like that. So I'll give you an example. Uh, this morning when I woke up, I found this image in the ID request section 
and my assistant, Hedel, had made a tentative ID, then I confirmed the ID, noted a problem with the locality, and all of a sudden we've got a B with a host association noted by the submitter, and we just keep doing this thousands and thousands of times and gradually build up a huge database, which I can curate using my phone down to the species level, and so this is actually archived permanently on an, a species page. So it's not like, say, Flickr, where you just have an image database. This is actually a rigorous sort of taxonomic database that grows and grows and builds and can be actively edited and curated. Are you the only curator? No, there's a whole bunch. Oh. So you can see um, what, what ends up happening is that um, like Cadell works, she's a, my, my assistant who works in New York City, and she lives in New Jersey, so she's 12 hours different. So when I'm sleeping, she makes a preliminary ID. But she knows I'm going to be checking it. So she just says, she knows I'm going to come along and, and verify her work. So she just throws that out there, and then, and then I can uh, do it. So we work as a team 24 hours a day where, well, everyone in North America is sleeping. I'm working on it here, and, and vice versa. How many other people are there? Um, there's um, hundreds of people who have some dealings with the site, and there's probably a few, several dozen very active users, many people with PhDs, a lot of real scientists. Uh, sorry, you mean who are helping to curate the photo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, dozens and dozens of actual experts besides me uh, are into this. So when I first started doing this, my colleagues would say, it's impossible to identify these from images to species. Mm -hmm. In particular, this genus Andrina, because there's more than 466 species in the USA. You know, so people would say, there's too many species, we cannot possibly identify them. But even for your untrained eye, you can see the visual diversity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this one's co covered in orange fur. We got blue ones. We have red-tailed ones, and so on. So over time, we've just proved them wrong over and over again. That whenever somebody says you can't identify things, you can see it in birds that people said you could never identify these gulls or these war fall warblers or whatever. And now we can identify all of them. And it's heading that way in the insect world as well. So, so what, what makes it that it's identified? I mean, what is the difference between the species that people say is the reason you can't? You can't the way you can it? identify them is if you know all the literature mm -hmm. and you've spent years and years working every single day with them in the collection, and you've seen them in life in the field, and you photograph them yourself, and the photo is ultra high res. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If all those things are happening, you can do amazing things. If you're missing some of those elements, you have to have experience in the collection and in the field in real life in order to put the pieces together to then take it to the next level. Because you can't see the characters that are in the keys. Mm -hmm. You have to infer it from little clues and hints and subtle things like, look at this host plant here. And this bee was actually flying in like the middle of winter, mm -hmm. in like January or something. So using that information, even though it looks like a sort of generic bee, the fact that it's on this plant in the winter, I know it's got to be this very esoteric species that it is. Hmm. Is that like an optimum position that we should be in to make it easier for you? Um, usually what people do is they, they submit a whole series of images. Oh, okay. So often they'll have four or five, even ten images of the same bee. So looking at all the images. So then what we can do is make... So virtual really when you say you're proving these skeptics wrong, do sometimes you then go and verify your identification by some other method? Or? Um, you can say you're proving them wrong, but they might respond, well, we don't believe you, we don't believe your identification. Usually, yeah, there is an element that a lot of times you, you haven't proven, you've just made a, proven is too strong of a word, you've made a strong case for it. But often people will say you can never identify the species, then you'll find that someone will submit an image that's so sharp, or at su such a high resolution, or from a particular angle that you actually can see the diagnostic character. So people do challenge it, and then it's a question of, the usual conversation goes, these look all look the same, and then you say, no, they don't. Here's a very subtle feature that you can actually see in the photo. So you can't just, you, you have to be able to really note the difference. So in other words, somebody might say, well, there's no way you could identify this from another species, but then I could say, oh, no, but look at the femur, it's red, and the other one's black. So it's, it's, it's sort of a tuning yourself into more and more subtle features and documenting that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you have to be able to see it in the collection. But it gets really tricky, because here's some guy in Oklahoma, in the middle of the US, in a place that's never been collected by anybody. Nobody has ever made professional collections here that I know of. And so he's finding all these things that we never see, that they're not in the Smithsonian, that we can't, don't have in our reference collection. So it becomes really detective work trying to figure out what are, what are all these things. And so these people you've never met are actually 
together with you making a, a virtual um, inventory of this uh, really remote place, um, and you find a lot of new state records and other range extensions and other information about biogeography. Like here, this is a southern bee that's supposed to be in Florida and Georgia and places like that. Very distinctive with the black wings. Now it's found in southern New Jersey where it was never found before. And we think that as the climate warms up, it may be moving north. Maybe it was just overlooked before, we don't know, but it's indicative of, of some changes. So we're not just finding the same thing we already know from the specimens, we're actually getting new, uh, new distributional data. We get very rare special things like Mexican tropical species, like this parasitic bee that show up in Arizona. This bee showed up in Florida on the right, which is also found at University Hall in Singapore. So we can detect and monitor the spread of the exotic bees using the images. Same bee, Florida, and in Southeast Asia where it's native. Where are the wings on the right? Hmm? Where are the wings? It's just blurred out because oh, it's fancy. Also, the, the common name, we, we made up this name. Basically, the bees don't have common names, so we just make them up. When I get bored, and I tap away on the phone, <laughs> tap the name, post it, and the bird people have committees and such, but I just do, I just do it on my phone when I get bored. <laughs> So you mentioned the term exotic bees. Um, yeah. What does that mean, exotic? These are all exotic bees. So every bee here was photographed in North America. Okay. It was native to Europe or Asia. and has no business being in North America. It's only there because it was transported through human commerce mm -hmm. to the USA. So they're basically stowaways. Okay. There's an article of commerce. It could be a plant. It could be a piece of wood with a hole in it. It could be any, anything. Um, a lot of these bees, like this one, will nest in hollow uh, cavities of different sorts. So imagine you've got a, a wood crate that has a hole in it. This bee could nest in it, brought to the USA, and then it flies out and does its thing. So this is a, a European species that's making a ball of plant wool that it uses to make its nest. It's a wool carder bee. It has um, special equipment to card the wool. And they just keep coming. So this showed up, this was just published this year, I believe. It's in a Chinese or East Asian bee that showed up in California. Mm -hmm. And so this one and then the three on the right all showed up on bug guide in the image database, were identified by the citizen scientists before they actually were published in print. And we get things like this. This is uh, an Eastern bee. This is a map that's auto-generated by bug guide along with auto-generated phenological chart showing the, the flight season by months. But it's, in, it's supposed to be an Eastern bee but you notice there's an anomalous thing in British Columbia. That's because the species was brought by the greenhouse industry for commercial pollination of tomatoes and such. The greenhouse industry says it has so-called queen excluders so that the reproductive bumblebees can't escape from the controlled greenhouse. They say only a few workers occasionally get out. But the citizen scientists went out there and they found the queen and the male mating out in the field in British Columbia. <laughs> right, you know, here. So. It's very good for ground truthing, uh, keeping keeping honest the policymakers and such. We find new species. In this case, we knew about this new species in Florida, and we were going to the site. So I, I contacted my friend, who's not my real friend. He's my virtual online friend, and he's a cop. And in his free time, he goes out and takes photos of these bees. So by enlisting uh, our online community friends, we were able to get this photo of the bee, or he was, with his forehead um, contacting all the pollen, and then there it is in the pin specimen. I think you'll agree, having a photo with help from the citizen scientists is much more interesting than just having the boring old pin specimen. What are you going to call it? Oh, it's already been described in 2011. It's called Calaminthe, which is named after the host plant, but then it, the name of the host plant changed, so it's named after a junior <laughs> synonym of the host plant. <laughs> what about a common name? You haven't, you haven't given it a common name. Um, it's the Calaminth uh, osmia. Uh, this is another new species that we found with a giant long face. And so it stood out like a sore thumb as soon as they posted it, we knew it was this new species that I had found earlier in the specimen collection. And by tracking down the citizen scientists, we found the nest site in the sand hills. Now we have the habitat, we have the host plant, and we have the nests, um, thanks to the online report. What are you going to call it? 
something boring like Floridensis. Are you are you asking so that he's gonna name something after you? <laughs> <laughs> New names are always an honor like, yeah. to, to, to hand out. This was interesting. So we start getting into the documenting behavior with the citizen science. Um, here's a photo I took in Turkey of the territory of bumblebee perched. Here's a Peruvian species perched. And then here's a North American species, but it's actually perched on the top of the Empire State Building. So the bees like to, to perch on the highest point they can find when they're territorial. This one's gone up to 102nd floor, like the King Kong of bees is sitting there waiting for the female to come up, and they have big eyes, and when they see the female, they fly up and contact her. What are these guys doing? So you can constantly mine, when you're doing this science uh, databases, you constantly see amazing photos showing the behavior. We've got sleeping bee grappling, grappling the branch with a mandible, upside down sleeping bee, they do it in groups, and so on. It's also a way to monitor rare species. This bee uh, was thought to be severely declining, and there are very, very few recent records from professional specimen collector collections but the, the photographers go out there and find them in various places. Here's an even rarer bee that Canada declared an endangered species, and the U.S. is actually now getting sued by the conservation groups for not responding to the petition to list it as endangered. And so again, some of the only recent records that are critical for death, locating the habitat of the species come from the online photographers. Are these prairie species? This used to be common across most of eastern North America. And it was wiped out not by habitat loss, but by um, exotic pathogens that came in mm. with the greenhouse industry, mm. we think. But the, the prairie habitat seemed to be where it's holding on. So it may be that it's got sort of wiped out from everywhere but the highest quality habitats. So then we need to integrate the different professional and citizen science data. And we, I do a lot of that through Discover Life with help from my colleagues. Or, uh, in particular, a computer scientist named John Pickering, who runs the site. So one of the things that I've been involved with is digitizing historical collections. So um, Hadel Go, my assistant again, takes these lovely photos, not just of the bees, but also of all the historical labels. And then we do this on a very large scale and capture all the label data for uh, more than a quarter million specimens at AMH and alone so far. And we use a web-based system that's open source, so that in theory, at least anybody can download it and start using it for arthropods. It's quite user-friendly, and we share authority files, meaning share data across uh, projects to make it more efficient. And it's all web-based, so that we, we've had, not so much in our project, but on related projects, they've had people working in Russia, like St. Petersburg, and in Australia simultaneously through the multi-thread online database with people in USA. Uh, everything's available online and meets all the standards, or not, as you prefer. And we get there's tons and tons and tons of data. So this is all just with the specimen collections. But keep in mind that this all interacts and uh, is complementary to the citizen science data, which is also mapped. And from certain areas, we just have mass numbers of records that allow for uh, biogeographic analyses and statistical analyses of all sorts. Like this shows the the bees emerge uh, earlier in the year when it gets warmer. So climate change is leading to earlier emergence, which is pretty obvious, but we found also some other less obvious things I won't go into. So we're basically trying to map everything. And by everything, I mean the, the specimen records, literature records, and especially holotype information that I extract out of uh, all kinds of revisions and other publications. And then uh, everything in yellow is actually a photo, which we map. So we treat the photos as virtual specimens, and we map them, and then we error check them, and do all, of, all the things that we do with specimens. So this database here, the yellow one, is actually my photo database of live photos of creatures the bug guide. Animals. What? That's not the bug guide. No, this is not bug guide. Although we can map bug, bug guide data too. This uh, site is actually mapping all kinds of data from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Basically anything they can beg, borrow, and steal from the web, including the global database, is all getting mapped and error checked and whatever. Hardly anything from Australia. 
compared to all the other regions? Yeah, that's just an artifact of, of the American Museum collection, uh -huh. being quite poor in that area. Also, Australia has a lot of big areas in the desert where nobody ever can really go unless they make a special expedition. But where you would expect a lot of bees. I've never personally been to Australia as well, so that's reflected. Um, well, it sounds like that's a trip. <laughs> I don't know anything about bees, so. Yeah, so then we, what, what we do is interesting is we apply the, the quality control tools that we develop for the specimens to the actual citizen science image database. What this means is that all the photos have the names of the creatures which are then checked against the global authority files, meaning the official lists, and then everything that doesn't match is spit out here. So we're, what we're trying to do is get to the point where whether the, the things are sent in by a grade school student or anybody, or whether they're sent in by the Smithsonian, it doesn't really matter to us. We just want to cross-check everything dynamically and automatically against the authority files and separate the good from the bad. Then with the image databases, we assign a number, which is a grade, like this 2, 3, and whatever. And that way we can, se again, separate them all out and determine where they go on the specimen databases. So here we're integrating the, the specimens, the maps, and also the images of the live creatures together in one place, which is a species page that we have for all of the world species. We also have it for all the plant, not all, but a huge number of plant species as well. And then what we can do is take a record like the host's record, which is derived from, not from a specimen, but from the actual image. So the, the, the image, the connection between the bee and the image is then uh, recorded in a, on the page, and then we can map the bee plus the host plants together. So the point is to integrate across taxa between animals and plants mm -hmm. and to use the um, so-called amateur um, image database as virtual specimens that inform the result. And then looking more locally, what do we do? How do we put this all together? Um, I've been working with Hedel Go again, I, my assistant, to make Bees of New Jersey project and so it has many facets, but she goes out and she collects huge numbers of bees. Then she photographs huge numbers of bees. She goes and makes connections with all different collections, including minor collections, brings them back to the mothership, which is AMH, and we database them. We capture them all in the professional database. Then uh, she makes these maps and we identify gaps, right? And then she goes and targets and goes out and collects them and then tries to enlist um, her citizen scientists, often whom have, often they have a lot more time on their hands than the professionals. And they'll get people, maybe a retiree, and say, go to this county and collect a whole bunch of bees. And then they do that, and we gradually fill in the, the map. So we've been able to get a lot of publicity, um, even though she's very, very shy. She got in the paper, and then all of a sudden, all the photographers in the area started contacting her, and, and we have just generating a huge um, citizen science database to complement our specimen database. And what we're trying to do is the, to, to do the citizen science and, and document the photos, but we're also trying to, to do the real science or the professional science at the same time. It's not separate. So what happens is she photographs a rare bee like this. It's never, ever been, been photographed before. And then to prove the ID, like to answer Ryan's question, how do we know that it really is that? Then she goes with a net, collects it, brings it back uh, to the museum. Then we database it. Then we image the pin specimens, show uh, features that we can't see in in the field, although the field gives you the documentation of the interaction with the host plant. This is actually a parasitic species, very, very rare. And then this so, is... Sorry, parasitic, do you mean the, like a, a hive parasite, or...? This is, is in a gray zone between a hive parasite and not, because it's a, a social parasite of a very primitively social bee. So imagine the world's smallest social colony, it would have one queen and one worker. So these tiny mini colonies of minimally social, permanently social bees get um, attacked by one of these bees with its big sickle mandibles that can go in and, and dominate, and it essentially usurps the legitimate queen and becomes a false queen or inquiline. There's, there's a term called inquiline, and she then dominates the workers, which are actually of another species, and has them go out and... What, what makes the workers follow her? Uh, a combination of the fact that she's physically dominant, see the big head? Uh -huh. 
Uh, yeah, but you fly away and, and you go. Well, what, what happens <laughs> is that the, it, they, they use pheromones and, and things like that, but the, the hormonal state of the bees can also change whether they've been bullied. They have sort of a pecking order. Like imagine, same thing with hens. So this one comes in with her big mandibles and her big head, and she can physically dominate. And then over time, she takes on the scent of the nest. And then she smells like she belongs, and then they, then they follow her. Does she look similar to the um, host bee? She does, and she's actually fairly related. There's just a paper that came out in Cladistics sequencing this thing and showing, testing in terms of Emery's rule, are the parasites related to their host? Are they a sister? Um, not quite, but close to it. They're, they're, they're in lineages which are sister, but the actual species are not sister. So they're, they're closely related, but not... Yeah. So this is showing what we're... What's happening in Singapore is we... Uh, <coughs> this is Adeline's bee. You want to tell the story? Oh, no, it's not a very exciting story. <laughs> I stepped on the bee. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I was looking at the poster. I stepped on the bee and I, I was like, it went bzzz. And I was like, oh my god. So I pushed it to the side and I thought to myself, it can't be a very rare bee if I stepped on it. But then I thought I should just take a photo and send it. It's even more rare now. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, no, no, it was still alive after I just kind of bumped it. And I took a photo and I, so I thought, well, I should just send it to John and see what it is. And then you can tell, you can tell them what it is. <laughs> no, I got very mad because I thought you didn't have a specimen. Yeah, because I was just how I left it there. <laughs> yeah, that's very terrible. But then she, she retrieved it and it was still alive. And then we got beautiful photos of the live bee. And it was uh, we, we brought it to Zestin So, who's our master bee photographer. And he came up with this. And he so looked so happy that he had a live bee to photograph. I've never <laughs> seen anyone so happy to, with a live bee. We were quite thrilled because it's a nocturnal species that we've, we're never, we never encounter because it only flies at night. And only some people are lucky enough to find it during the day. And, and there is no and museum record of it yet, so it's okay. This is the this is the one for the museum, right? Yeah, okay. it's a good one. So that's uh, then we're going to go into like a practical session. That's it for the talk. But yeah, so just curious, does a map reflect like um, native and non-native species? Like, how did this non-native species, where it's supposed to be, or where is it usually found? Does it show any form of like? on the map itself, like some form of trash or something like that? Yeah, usually what people do is you use the specimen database to capture as much data as possible. Okay, so if they just type in the name, then they realize, hey, why is there like this? Picture? Actually, it's not properly tagged. No. We're, we're at a stage where um, a lot of the really essential information and quality control tools either don't exist or they're not applied globally. Uh, how do I say this nicely? There's an infinite number, no, there's hundreds of things that everybody wants to mm -hmm. happen mm -hmm. that, that are not happening okay. due to lack of resources. The, the tragic thing is that the computer scientists exist who can code it. The biologists have the data, everything's together, but nobody has the resources or wherewithal to put it together, mm -hmm. largely because of misplaced priorities. By is there any research being done on any of the uh, exotic bee species that could have possibly occurred at um, Gardens by the Bay? Yeah, I had a, a Europe student named Jonathan who went down to Gardens by the Bee, Gardens by the Bay, and studied. Gardens by the Bee. Yeah, Gardens by the, the Bee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any uh, exotic bee species that were essential? No, no. You found native bee species missing a whole array of exotic flowers. Cool. With the exotic bee species, what people like to do is use the specimen data to capture really detailed information about their native range, and then you can make a model of mm -hmm. their climatic mm -hmm. associations. Then you can extrapolate that or, or map that onto the area of, for example, you can take the, the model of its mm -hmm. habitat from Europe, map that onto North America, mm -hmm. and you can predict where it's going to be found. Okay. So people, that's a, it was a really trendy thing to do maybe 10 years ago, and now it's sort of out of style, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, there's a lot of interesting things to do with the exotic bees, especially if you have molecular data. And you can look at where do they come from? What was their population size? Did they go through a bottleneck? How many independent origins are there? Kind of stuff. The previous picture that you showed is the nocturnal bee. How is it different from the daytime bees? And how do they work on the flowers if it's not at night? 
the most obvious difference is, is here. This big circle here, big shiny tail thing, is a giant ocelli, or ocellus. The ocelli are simple, three simple eyes, like a third eye. In this case, it's three third eyes that are on the forehead. And they, they use those in orientation at night. So by having these giant um, simple eyes, it allows them to fly at night and keep their uh, detect the moon or whatever they're doing. Interesting. Otherwise, uh, uh, normal bees would have the so-called the, the third eye. No, they all have it. It's just that it's usually small. <coughs> These are maybe four or five times bigger than they are in a regular bee. Mm -hmm. Because they need to have much greater light gathering ability. So this nocturnal habitat's evolved several times in completely unrelated groups. And what's interesting is in the uh, New World, you see it in the sweat bees, which are a totally different family. But then in the Old World tropics, we get, or in, in Asia in particular, we get the carp large carpenter bee. Mm. But the, a bee very much like, uh, the same genus lives in South America, but they've never evolved nocturnal behavior there. Sure, why? But we don't know much about it because it flies at night. The experts go out in the day. What's a sister lineage? <coughs> Bees? Yeah. What, what does it mean, the word sister? What is a sister lineage in general? Yeah. It means the closest relative. The nearest relative, okay. just like your sister is your closest relative. You know. mm -hmm. It means that uh, if you go back to the most recent branching point with another lineage, it's that other lineage. Okay. So for birds, it's what crocodiles for living animals. Humans, what chimps and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for bees, it's a group of wasps called the apoid wasps or the carbonate wasps. So every every animal has its sister group, it's just that we don't always agree about what it, what it is. Okay. All sister species. So every yeah. species right. is sister species. Every... It depends on your species concept. Oh, no. But yeah. no. You can have a species that has a, that a sister to a whole group of species. It's yeah. true, true. Mm -hmm. So a yeah. sister group. Every taxon has a sister taxon. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going? Yeah. Look at it. Did we get beer? Yay! <laughs> beer and pinning. Uh, oh, <laughs> don't pin yourself. You didn't bring it. What? You didn't bring it, right? Bring beer? No. <laughs> Do you speak to her at least? <laughs> no. <laughs> but isn't there somewhere around here to go for me? Yes, yeah, skill house. Sounds good. That's why the turnout's so low. Well, we can go next door. Isn't that the. Um, Gilda uh, bar? Yes. Yeah, we go there. Yeah. Oh, oh, the other way. It's on the other way. There's a bar. No, Gilda house. Near the alumni house. Yeah, Gilda house. Okay. Okay. That's a good idea. We'll yeah. pin yeah. and yeah. drunkly pin bees onto. I actually <laughs> forgot to pin the bees. <laughs> he forgot to bring his pins. <laughs> no, I forgot to bring my bees for real. Oh, <laughs> no, no, I didn't. I didn't. I remember where they are. They're here. Ah, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so. Are we gonna do this at the at the bar, really? Or no? No, let's this? do it here at the bar. So I caught all these today at U Haul. We can look at. Anybody want to help me dump them out? Okay. And just dump them into here. U Haul. Anybody wants to practice pinning their body pins and their body pins? Actually, wasp. What's the difference? Do you know how to pin? I pin Kaliopteran. You never pinned a bee and wasp? No. It's going to have to change. They look a lot um, smaller than that. Well, slimmer. I was pinning some very chubby. You're sexy. Look at that last place. How come you just
just throwing it around. When they're, um, they're, they're fine. I know what this is. This is <laughs> the cuckoo one. Right? Cloak and dagger bee. Yeah. Yes, cuckoo bee. The Correct. Theory, theory, furious. Furious. I remember like two things. I remember Dilokopo yeah. Mayo and I remember the theory. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, make me make a separate decision. Why? Um, you can just pile them together. Why was the saga? So, because anybody want to know? She had sent it in, but to you. Everyone yeah. 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 I didn't see that. Oh, really? Well, I checked all my emails for. Uh, so I know, it's a little bit on the right of the. Yeah, all my emails go to the same place. Oh, I see, I see. This is the rare Okay, so she hadn't sent it. Well, it might have gone guess and damn or something. Oh, okay. So I use my fingers to get it into a pinning position. She, uh, this is actually really cool. It's probably easier for them to submit an IVLE. This, this is a wasp, mm. but um, so I, I, I'm essentially pinching the thorax very gently between my fingers, okay. holding it in a horizontal position with it. It'll be, uh, it'll be better if I demonstrate with a bigger one so you can actually see what I'm doing. Then I find the uh, base of the wings. I go a little bit to the right of center, and then I enter the body, make sure it's all lined up straight, then push the pin through to the other side, making sure not to put the pin too far forward because if it contacts the front legs they can break off, which is bad. And then when I put it, I push it about a third of the way through, like that. You want to leave enough room at the top of the pin so you can comfortably hold it, see? The, you don't want to be bumping into the parts of the bee. Below. Oh. And then you need enough room below so to put the label. Okay. So the, about a third of the way down, you would put the label. For example, if you pin through the label, like you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. If that were a label with printed stuff on it, mm -hmm. then like that. you can see all those. So let me get a big one so it's easier to see. I'm curious, so you don't, you don't actually, um, how do I say it, straighten the torso? No, okay. don't do anything fancy. Don't do anything. Okay. Um, it depends. Often, if, especially if it's something rare or special. So, okay, so my usual protocol is like this. I get the box out, and I have different size pins. And I, before I even start pinning, I make a little cluster of each of the sizes of pins that I need. I'm doing it in sort of a goofy way. Cause I'm not. Okay, so these are our bigger pins. Pins come in different sizes. These are size 3, which are the biggest ones that we routinely use. Okay. So this would be for a large bee which would be something like, like this. Mm -hmm. That's large. Large bee, large wasp. Then uh, something like this is a two. And I make a little cluster mm -hmm. of each size, right? Then they're there when I need them. These are number, number one pins. So the ones are for the smallest bees that you can pin. They get if they get smaller, then you have to glue them and do other. Mm -hmm. There's other protocols for the other ones. How do you write so small on your labels? Do you use a magnifying? Glass? Usually, no. Usually, print them, print them out. Uh, maybe four point font or three point five font is what we usually use. So here's a. A wasp. It actually stung me, believe it or not. Now it's dead. <laughs> no, actually, they, they can sting multiple times. Once they're dead. So, okay, so I, I put the pin between the wing bases, a little bit to the right of center. And then I can line it up. And I don't really worry about the abdomen because it's going to flop around and do goofy things. But as long as the thorax is lined up, and then I pit, push it through like that. And when they're really fresh like this, it's hard to align them, but mm. when they start drying out just a little bit, you can manipulate the, the parts, get them looking pretty. Yeah. And I don't, I don't take that too far, but okay. um, if the legs are in a, the wrong position, you can take forceps and move them until they're looking good. Then I, Do you ever break them off accidentally? Yeah, you, they break all the time. It's mm -hmm. tragic. You glue them back on? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so then I just keep going, and I usually start at the biggest ones and go to the smallest ones. 
Mm. Let me just do a B, just so you can see an actual B. Here, I have a choice. I can either go with a three pin or a two. Usually I err on the side of the smaller one, just because it does less dam damage to the B. This one's uh, being a parasite. You can actually see some landmarks because it has like a little, a little stripe there at the midline. Mm -hmm. So I go just to the right of the midline and you can see the base of the wings. It's kind of hard to see, but you see where the wings attach? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm between those, or if anything, just a little bit behind, and essentially towards the rear of the thorax, just to the right of center, put in the pin, make sure everything's level, then uh, like that. And then I can um, kind of push the wings out, or the legs out, to make sure they're fully visible. The more advanced thing, is if you have a forceps, mm -hmm. you can open the mandibles, yeah. pull out the mouth parts, you can reach in and pull out the male genitalia. Okay. You can also grab the sting at the okay. apex and pull it out. Yeah. So you can basically expose the, yeah. the male and female Is it better to do it structures. all fresh as well for the pulling out? It, it is because if you do it, once the bee dries, it, 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 then it, you, you can dissect it, but it becomes much more difficult and you have to rehydrate the bee and it, you, yeah. you're, you're likely to break things. So it's, it's nice to do it when it's fresh. If it's too fresh, what will happen is you'll pull out the part and it will go flopping right back in. Okay. Because it's still basically, mm. uh, the muscles still mm. function in yeah. a way. So you pull it out, it goes right back in by reflex. Mm. Once it uh, is uh, more sincerely dead, and start to dry out a little bit, <laughs> then you can manipulate it and it stays put. And so there's a, a what, what we'll often do is, is pin the things and then maybe a few hours later do the manipulating. Manipulating. Or yeah. it depends all on the humidity of the area. Yeah. Like in the tropics, you could probably do the, the, do the next day. But if you're in the desert, you have to do it within a few hours where it gets dried out. But you know, like he was asking just now about, about um, killing them. So you said put in the freezer as one, right? I mean, that's. Yeah. Like, um, a pretty one while they're still alive while they're still alive yeah so that they when you take them out of the freezer is that really how it looks with the, the big separation <coughs> between the no. but that's a meal like wasp, 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 wasp right yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. is that really yeah. how it yeah. looks a big separation the between the yeah. 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 a year later I'm not going to name the chipotle no they, they do not the, 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 <laughs> the abdomen is, is what's called petiolate <laughs> okay. so the the wasp waist is greatly elongated and narrow interesting that all of the the digestive tract all the um, bodily functions travel down this incredibly narrow tube. Yeah. Anybody want to try pinning it? Mm -hmm. no, but it mechanically, it seems like if you pin it like that on the exothorax, wouldn't the weight at the abdomen sort of? It can. You can you can use paper to prop it up, okay. or you can this flip the entire right. box upside down so until okay. it dries, yeah. or you can just not worry about it. Yeah. I have to kill which is bird. usually what I do. You look good so much. If you have to um, like, kill one, yeah. you want to try? Do uh, you feel bad? Yeah, I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> you try. No, no, no. And now no, no. I come on, don't be shy. Good. Then again, we all eat chickens every day. And we expert. I'm gonna like stab myself with this. No, stab the bug. Don't stab yourself. You do kill it. Okay, so. Never mind. Actually, directly. Find the rear of the thorax. I'm just saying. Between the base of the wings. Tend to feel worse about things. Yeah. A little bit more forward. There. That looks good. Right of center, slightly. No, the first few. Put the first pin in. I wasn't able to do it, so I put. Line it up, then push it all the way through. Release them again, but after a while, you have to make a decision. Are you gonna? Yay! Let me find my snap in. Okay, now we get to critique it. Is it okay? Did I leg fall? That remains to be seen. Did I leg fall while I was doing it? It's perfect. Yay! Anybody else want to try? The last she B. set the bar pretty high there. The last B I ever pinned. <laughs> oh, no. Because <laughs> it was perfect. Oh. You want to try the fat one? Yeah. Okay. With these ones, when it's curled under like that, I often will straighten it out just to make it. I hope had some time to You can also turn my put it. Off. Another trick is you can actually. Yeah, pin can it. I do that? I you can pin it when it's like that. You turn the computer off when it's in the middle of doing something. So it's fine even if I pin it like that. Yeah. In the middle of doing something. Because you feel like you've killed something. In a way. You have killed. Oh, don't stop. Just talking about if uh, my computer's in the middle of doing something, right? Eh? Oh no, I can't see the wings though. I feel bad. You do? Yeah. 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 I don't know if you feel bad when you feel You've uh, taken away life support for your analyses. How right? can someone see the <laughs> wings of this? Bit, yeah. No, because the analysis will have uh, 
I'm not so sure if I'm piercing the wings or the the. You can move. You can move the wing aside, right? John, can you move the wing aside? You can. Can I what? Yeah, move the wings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then it's much better. You can open the wings up. You can spread them. Yeah. But bees don't count as animals. You can kill as many as you want. I know that's why I thought too. And then when I when I tried to catch some, I felt so bad putting it in the. So you killed the only individual of this nocturnal bee. Ah, I did not. No, I didn't kill it. No, no, I didn't kill it. I thought it. Hasn't been collected since. So I put it in a ziploc bag. Has it? Is it now? Yeah, we. He killed it. It's dead because of you. No, no, he killed it. Yeah, but it's because of you. I don't know who physically killed it. Yeah, but you, you were. She's an accessory to the crime. You know what happened? I put it in a ziploc bag and left it in my backpack. Equally guilty. Completely forgot about it the next day. And then I was just like, okay, okay so and then I pulled it out of the bag. Should I wait like that? Is it fine? Yeah. Oh. Like that? Then I yeah, felt it's perfect. very guilty. Okay. So this one's I, a little bit tough because like, it's black, so it's like, hard to see what yeah. it is. <laughs> that's what I kept it in the box bag, you know, like, like, yeah, in yeah, the dark. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. If only yeah. you look at you with this little <laughs> mandibles. And that will tell you on the top. I'm not so sure if you have that. It's a good idea. Yeah, okay, that's fine, though, because it's only part of the way. It's not fine if it's slender, but it's fine if it's part way through and it's slender. You can always take it back out. Line it up perfectly. Thoracic, uh, compression. And now try. And if you're and if you're worried about stabbing uh, yourself, you can do it like against the matrix, burn, like this. Mm -hmm. uh, See what I mean? You don't crush anything. You can hold it uh, and then just push through. Uh, try pushing and then it gags and then goes up. Okay. up uh, usually, nice okay. Okay. I think you did in the last few seconds. It, and if he hits, yeah, yeah, just now push yeah, it. Better. Push it up on this hand. It's not good. It's not nice. How often do you do this? Well. It's just fine. We were in Asia there for the collecting expedition uh, last year. Um, we killed about 120. Mm -hmm. Good. But here in Cincinnati, Anybody else want to try? Here, here yeah, I'll go for it. Okay. Why don't you try? Okay. You can do the next one after him. So.